Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, I just wanted to go over a little bit um, what they are, but I guess if you're already familiar, just very briefly. I don't know if you remember we first started talking about um, quantum mechanics and, and all that kind of bizarre stuff. We sort of um, looked at the fact that we could start drawing all these weird equations for all these orbitals and shapes and everything because people started looking at electrons less like a particle and more like a wave, if, if, if you remember that. And that light can be treated as both uh, a wave and a particle. Sometimes it is particle um, activity, sometimes it is wave activity. Well, in this instance, in with looking at um, molecular orbitals, the thought was there were certain things, certain properties that 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 uh, molecules had that did not match up very well with uh, atomic orbitals. You could change them. You could have hybridized orbitals and all that with, with different shapes. But some of the properties of, of molecules didn't make any sense. And so the thought was maybe if you looked at overall molecular orbitals, then you could start to explain some of this strange activity. And as it happens here, if we look at each of these electrons being a wave, remember what happens if, if I have two waves that look like this, and the second one looks like this. When I add those two waves together, what do I get? So I take wave number one and wave number two and I add them together. What's my wave number three going to look like? Anybody at all? <laughs> More maybe. <laughs> I don't think we ever learned this. We didn't go over this. Uh, not the addition, I don't think. Oh, okay. Well, who's a surfer out there? I got to have a couple of surfers. There's always a couple of surfers in the class. If you take two small waves, <clears throat> if the peaks match up and the troughs match up, when I add them together, what do you think I'm going to get? Two times the depth? Exactly. Yeah, they basically, they superimpose on top of one each other, and they're additive. So my, when I add those two together, my third wave is going to look like this. It's going to be even bigger. Where the, where the uh, peaks line up, where the, I'm going to get twice the, the height of the peak, and where the troughs line up, I'm going to get twice the depth of the troughs. So I'm going to get a wave twice as large. And in effect, that's what, oops, in effect, that's what's happening. That's what's happening here with our two orbitals. Our bonding orbitals, so if I have a wave here and a wave here, when they overlap with each other, I get overlap of those two orbitals. And now I'm getting twice the height and twice twice the, the depth. I'm getting I'm getting those cooperating basically and in, in showing that they are joined together between between the two nuclei. If I keep adding more waves, however, now if I have two new electrons, I put them here and here, I get something that looks like this. Let me show you. So my first wave will be like this. 
just like before. And my second one is going to look like this. So what happens when I add these two together? So I'm going to add these two peaks together, or this peak and this trough, and then this trough and this peak, and then this peak and this trough. What's that going to look like? A straight line. Exactly. Yeah, they cancel each other out. When I add those two together, I get this. So basically, I get no overlap at all, and they just sort of basically annihilate each other. And so they do not cooperate. They do the opposite. And so when you have that, basically, you don't see any waves in between the two atoms. So here's my nuclei number one for hydrogen. Here's my nuclei number two. When they overlap with each other, I get an increase of density in between the two. And when they don't overlap, they cancel each other out. What I get in the middle here is nothing. Notice that there's nothing. There's no density in between the two. I still have density here, and I have density here, but in between, nothing. So they basically, they've annihilated each other. And so those are what we call anti-bonding. And it's kind of weird. To, I mean, I know the whole fact of like, you know, bonding orbitals. Yeah, I get it. You know, you put two electrons in them and, and, and you get bonding. That makes sense. But you put two electrons together and they anti-bond. What does that even mean? This is where that comes from. So when, when the waves overlap um, with each other, they superimpose on each other and you get bigger, you get more density in between. And when they annihilate, when they're out of phase, they annihilate each other. And so basically, it's, they're not um, so much anti-bonding, they're preventing bonding from taking place. They eliminate um, the density of electrons between those, between those two atoms. So they don't contribute to bonding. Instead of anti, but they just we call them non-bonding. It's not like they go out of their way to destroy bonding, but they just, they don't. Um, cooperate with each other. And so that's why you get non-bonding orbitals. So what we're going to do is, remember this takes, this uh, happens with valence electrons only. Core electrons are still held on to um, by those atoms because they don't share core electrons, right? That's why we don't include them. But valence electrons in the outermost shells, those are the electrons that are going to be involved with uh, with bonding. So let's look at a couple of examples. We'll do like the first couple of these together and then, and then, then, then we'll, we'll go into our room. All right, so here we've got a diatomic molecule, diatomic silicon. So how many valence electrons do we have with silicon? What group is silicon in? Hopefully everyone still has their periodic table in front of them. Group four. Four. So how do we, so that means that it's four electrons in its outermost shell, right? So where do we put those? So there's going to be a silicon over here. And it's going to be a silicon over here. And first, so AO, what does the AO stand for? Atomic. Atomic orbital. Atomic orbitals, right. So these are the ones we sort of have been working with for a while now. Hopefully we understand them fairly well, S, P, D, F, all that good stuff. So let's fill in the, um, the four 
for each one. So here on the on this side, where do we put the first electron? Um, at the top, and then the right, then the bottom, then the left. I don't know what that means. Wait, are you asking about the valence electrons? Yeah, valence electrons for this particular silicon. We're going to put them in the atomic orbital. So we got four of them to put in there. Where does the first one go? Oh, 3s. Three. I thought you were talking about the dot structure. 3s. And where's the next one go? Um, 3s and then 3p2. Yeah. And then? 3p2. So we've got x, y, and z in the 3p. Where does the first one go? X. Mm -hmm. the second one? Y. Oh, Right, there you go. <coughs> Excuse me. And since the other one is also silicon, its four valence electrons will be exactly the same. So now, when those two come together and form molecular orbitals, remember we fill out the molecular orbitals exactly the same way we do with all the Kunz rule and Ausbau rule. Those are still in effect. So we still put them in one at a time. And we don't pair them in degenerate orbitals like P, where they have three equal um, energy orbitals. You don't put them in there until you filled the whole thing. So what does what does the sigma and sigma star stand for? What is the what are those two? What is a sigma orbital? Or what's the, what's the sigma bond? I'll put it that way. What's the, what's the sigma bond? Like the first bond when the two um, atoms hybridize? Um, yes, it's, it's the very first bond. There's two things happily you can, you can define it as. Yes, it's, it's all single bonds for one thing. All single bonds are, sing, are sigma bonds. And why? Because those are the bonds that directly, the electrons that directly overlap with each other. So these are the bonds where you have hybrid orbitals overlapping with other hybrid orbitals. So you have direct overlap. So if this is my atom number one, and this is my atom number two over here, a sigma bond will be direct overlap of orbitals to give you electron density directly in between those two. So all single bonds are sigma bonds, whether or not they're hybridized orbitals or not. That's what a, that's what a sigma um, orbital is, or a sigma bond, is that direct overlap. So where do we put our first so this is the order. So that's the order in which we fill up the molecular orbitals. And remember, we always start at the lowest energy and then work our way up, remember? So where does the first electron go? We have eight now. Instead of four, we have eight total um, valence electrons that go into the molecule. So we have eight to fill in. So where does the first one go? 3s sigma. 3s sigma, right. And what about the next one? 3s sigma. Pointing down, right? Because mm -hmm. we always have to remember that this is just, just like um, um, the rule where no two electrons can have exactly the same address. This is also true. If two electrons are in exactly the same space, one of them has to be spinning up and the other one has to be spinning down. So that's two. We're down to six. Where do the next two go? 3s sigma star. Mm-hmm. And sigma star, what does the star stand for? Like the excited? Mm, nope. Sort of, but no.
So if sigma is the orbital where we have direct overlap and a sigma bond forms, what's sigma star? What's the star stand for? Yeah, that's the anti-bonding orbital. I mean, I still don't like anti, it should be non-bonding, but yeah, it's the anti-bonding orbital. So when they overlap like this, that's the bonding orbital. And remember, the next set of electrons you put in there, their wave functions are going to cancel each other out. So I'm going to have electrons here, and I'm going to have electrons over here, but in between there's going to be nothing. So these are my anti-bonding orbitals. So the next two electrons go in here. One, two. Now I'm down to four. So where do my next four electrons go? Where does my next one go? 3p pi. Mm-hmm the first one, right? So I guess, and what about the next one? Um, the line to the right of that? The other, right, there's two pi orbitals. So the next one goes to the second, like that. So now I'm down, I have two electrons left. So where does the, where do the last two go? Uh, 3p pi. Which one? Uh, one on each. Yeah, the first one goes here, right, and the second one goes there. And now I'm done. I'm out of, I'm out of electrons. I don't, have, I don't have any more. So why are these 3p pi? Why not 3s pi? Why are they called 3p pi orbitals? Have you learned about that or thought about that? What makes, um, what orbitals are responsible for making pi bonds? You know which orbitals are responsible for, for making pi bonds. Yes, p orbitals are. But, but, but we, that's why they're called pi bonds, actually. Let me, let me show you one. So pi bonds and sigma bonds are really different from each other. So as I've showed, when you have so here I've got my one atom over here and my other atom over here. So when they form a sigma bond, there is direct overlap between them. So here's my one, two. So I got two atomic orbitals. They overlap with each other. I get electron density in between them, and we call that a sigma bond. Now those come from either S orbitals or hybrid orbitals, like sp, sp2, S, um, those kind of orbitals, where there's direct contact, there's direct overlap between them. So hybridized orbitals like sp, sp2, sp3, they're responsible for making all sigma bonds. All sigma bonds are made from hybridized orbitals. That's something to, to remember. Now, once you've used up all the hybridized orbitals making sigma bonds, the only electrons you have left are in the p orbitals. If there's electrons left over, those are in p orbitals. And when you make um, p orbitals overlap, do you remember what shape p orbitals are in? 
So if this is my, if this is my um, nucleus, what shape, you remember what shape the T orbitals took on? What do they look like? Ties. You think? Like bow ties? Yeah, exactly. Like bow ties or balloons tied in the middle. They look like this, if you remember. So that would be coming in and out. And then we had another one going up and down. And then we had another one going side to side. So we had X, Y, and Z. Well, the X, this is this one here, is the one that gets hybridized with the S orbital to make a hybrid. So the X is gone. What we're left with is the Y going up and down, or the Z coming in and out. So coming out at us or going behind. Those are the two P orbitals that are left over. So when we come back here to our to our to our atom, if it's going to be making another, if there's another P electron left, it's going to look like this, right? It's going to have it's going to go up and down. Like this. They are not going to directly overlap with each other. They're going to basically Share some contact both above and below the two nuclei. So we're going to have electron density above and below. And that is a pi bond. A pi bond is weaker than a sigma bond because you don't have that direct overlap like you do with a sigma bond. You have much less electron density because it's both above and below the, 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 the two atoms. So that's the that's a pi bond. The second, if you have so that would so a double bond would be one sigma plus one pi. So you would have density directly in between the atoms for a sigma, then you'd have density both above and below for the pi. That's a double bond. What if you were to have the triple bond? Well, with the triple bond, you use the electron that is now in the PZ or PZ axis, both coming at you or away from you. So the second one would be behind the two atoms and in front of the two atoms. So you would have density here and then density behind. So that would be a sigma plus a pi plus a second pi bond, and that would give you a triple bond. Okay? So that's where so that's why they're called pi bonds. They're made with p orbitals, so we call them pi bonds. And the only electrons that make pi bonds are p. So that's why. That's why these electrons um, in the p uh, pi orbitals, that's why they're called p pi orbitals, because it's p electrons making them. So let's finish this one up. So we had one, two, three, four. And we had one, two, three, four. So there's four electrons here, four electrons here. This is what it looks like when we put them in the molecular orbitals. So the question is, what is the bond order of this molecule? So I have a silicon, silicon molecule. What's the bond order going to be? How do we determine what the bond order is? What does bond order mean, anyway? I 
if I have a hydrogen hydrogen bond, what's the bond order there? So what would be the bind bond order of H2? And you guys said you had like four classes in this already. Yeah, I don't know about everybody else, but I've never heard of bond order. Bond? Oh, okay. Anybody else heard of bond order? So this is, this part is new. No one else has heard of it. Ooh, okay. So bond order basically is a measure of how many bonds there are, right? So a hydrogen, hydrogen has a single sigma bond. So it has a bond order of one. So oxygen, has a sigma and a pi. Because remember, the first bond is always sigma, and any subsequent bonds are always pi. So if what, what do you think the bond order of, of O2? What's the bond order of O2? Two. Two. And if I have nitrogen, It has one sigma, and how many pi bonds would it have? Two. Two. So it has one sigma and two pi bonds. So what's its bond order? Three. Three, exactly. Now, where it gets tricky for bond order is what if, have you looked at benzene? Anyone remember what benzene is? Carbon six, uh, hydrogen six. Right. So each one of these points is carbon, and each one has a single hydrogen. And when we're and when organic chemists draw the structure, that they, they, they when they draw hydrocarbons, they basically leave the hydrogens off get faster, but this is what it would look like. So there's a double bond and then a single bond, a double bond and then a single bond, a double bond and then a single bond. But this can also be drawn like this. These two electrons can move here, and these two electrons can move here, and these two electrons can move here. So it also looks like this, where the where the double bonds have just moved over one, one position. In actuality, all these bonds are exactly the same length. So which one is, is shorter, a double bond or a single bond? Double bond. Double bond, that's right. Do you know why? Mm, because double bond is stronger than a single bond and they got tied each other maybe. right because the p maybe. orbitals have to be pushed together a little bit closer in order for them to overlap so a double bond is a little bit shorter because the, the p orbitals need to overlap in order to make any make any bond at all and so a triple bond is even shorter because then you even need more p orbitals to overlap so a single bond is about that big and then a double bond is like that and a triple bond is, is, is like that but the weird thing about benzene, each one of these bonds is exactly the same size. And they're shorter than a single bond, but they're longer than a double bond. So what do you think the bond order is of each one of those carbon-carbon bonds? Remember, they're longer than a double bond, but they're shorter than a single bond. Take a guess what the bond order would be. Six. Mm, six would mean you'd have six bonds in, in between each between each carbon.
Nope, it's not two. Two would be a double bond. Remember, I said it's not, it's, it's stronger than a single bond. It's not as strong as a double bond. That length is longer than a double, but shorter than, than a single. So it's in between. So the bond order is in between one and two. What do you think it is? It is 1.5. 1. 1. Exactly. It's one and a half. The bond order is one and a half. And the way we sort of come to that is because when we look at the number of bonding electrons there are. Let's draw that out again. Oops. Let's look at the number of bonding electrons there are between these, these carbons. So I've got six carbons here, right? One, two, three, four. And how many bonding electrons do I have? Well, each single bond is two. So I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, right? So there's making the sigma bonds, I've got 12. So I've got 12 electrons making sigma bonds. And making pi bonds, I've got two, four, six more electrons making pi bonds. Electrons making pi bonds. That means I've got a total of 18 electrons making bonds, and I've got six carbons sharing those electrons making those bonds. So each carbon basically has three electrons making bonds, right? For each, each carbon, it's like three electrons making bonds for them. How many electrons does it take to make a bond? Two. So if I got three making bonds, and it takes two to make a bond, what's my bond order? 1.5. Three divided by two, exactly. If it takes two electrons to make, to make a bond, and I got three, my bond order is one and a half. If each carbon's got four electrons making bonds, well, it's got two making a sigma and it's got two making a pi. It's got two bonds for a bond order of two. If it had five electrons making bonds and it takes two to make, to make a single bond, its bond order would be two and a half. And if it had six electrons making bonds, that would be two making a, a, a sigma, and four making a pi. So one sigma, two pi, that's three. So we do the same thing here with our molecular orbitals. Let's put our electrons back. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So how many of these electrons are making bonds and how many are not? So what we do is we add all the electrons that are making bonds and we subtract the electrons that are not making bonds. So how many electrons are making bonds? Six. Six, exactly. We've got two, four, six that are in bonding orbitals. And the electrons making bonding orbitals are the ones making bonds. So we've got six making bonds. How many are not making bonds? Two. Two. So we got these two not making bonds. So that leaves us with a net of four electrons making bonds. Now how many electrons does it take to make a bond? Two. 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 So we divide that two. by two and so our bond order is? Is two. Two. So we figure that out by bond order equals one half times my bonding electrons minus my anti-bonding electrons. Because the anti-bonding, and I guess this is why they're called anti-bonding electrons. The anti-bonding electrons actively keep 
the, those electrons in forming bonds, so we, sub so we subtract them. So that means that silicon, di diatomic silicon has a double bond. That's all that means, okay? Can we try one more? Let's yeah. Put the next one together. So here we have sulfur monoxide, but it has a positive charge. It's important to remember that it has a positive charge. So we're going to put sulfur on this side, and we're going to put O oxygen plus on this side. So how many electrons is sulfur going to have? Valence electrons. Six. Mm hmm It's in group six. So let's, let's where do the first two go? In uh, the atomic orbital. Three. Three S. Three S. And then we have four left. So where do they go? Three P. One, <laughs> two, three. I got one left. Uh, on the X. Yeah. On the X. Right. So there's my six electrons for sulfur. How many electrons is oxygen plus the, uh, the cation of oxygen going to have? Valence. Five. Five. Right. Normally it's six, but it lost one. Now it only has five. So one, two, and then two, four, five. Now let's start putting in our Atomic, let's start filling out our atomic orbital. So now we have a total of 11 to go in there. So let's start putting them in. Where do the first two go? 3s sigma. Yep. And the next two? 3s sigma star. Mm -hmm. So that leaves us at seven. Okay. The next two? 3p sigma. Mm hmm. One, two. And then keep going. I got uh, five left. 3p pi four um, there. Mm hmm. Where's, so that's where does the next one go? Um, to the right. To the right. Remember, these are degenerate orbitals. Degenerate means they're of the same energy. Not like you're a de filthy degenerate, but degenerate means they're the same energy. So I need to fill. And because electrons repel, repel each other, they want to be as far away from each other as they can before you start overlapping them. So one, two, so I got three more to do. So where does the next three go? Um, uh, three P pi and then one on three P pi star. So two go in three P pi and then the one I've left goes in three P pi star. Right, so that's a total of 11, right? Two, four, six, eight, and 11. Okay, so what is my bond order gonna be? Four. Now remember, I can't have a bond order greater than three because I can't have more than a triple bond between, between two atoms. I can't have four bonds between two atoms. We only have three. So the maximum bond order is, is, is three. Oh, so remember, we count the bonding electrons and we subtract the non-bonding or the anti-bonding electrons. So how many bonding electrons do I have? Eight. Electrons in bonding orbitals. One. Eight. Eight. So two, four, six, eight. Right, so I have eight. And how many are in non-bonding orbitals? Three. So in non-bonding orbitals, I've got two, three. So eight minus three, and then remember, so I have a net of five bonding electrons. But it takes two electrons to make a bond, so I divide that number by two, and what's my bond order? 
right? So it means we have, basically what that means is that we have um, two ways of representing that particular, um, that particular molecule. If we were to draw a Lewis structure of it, we would see that we would have a hybridized version. We'd have one where there were two bonds and there'd be another version where it had three. And because the two of them are equally uh, possible, they're in um, hybridization, then the bond order is exactly in between the first structure and the second structure. The first structure is two bonds, second structure is three. You know that somewhere in between, the structure is an average of two and a half bonds between the two of them. So the other question comes up. Um, actually, I'm just going to skip to the next one and then I'll let you guys work on these for a while. I want to do this, this one because it had a bunch of different uh, things to learn. So we have three different versions of fluorine, divalent fluorine. One, where we have just normal um, divalent fluorine. One, where we have fluorine that's a divalent cation. And we have another one where we have fluorine as a divalent anion. And so there's two things I want to um, point out to you. Have you learned about magnetism? Why things are magnetic? Why some things are magnetic and some things aren't? What does an atom or a molecule need to be magnetic, to be attracted to a magnetic field? Have you learned about magnetism? No, I don't think so. Oh man, there's a bunch, bunch going on here. It was, um, you need unpaired electrons to be magnetic. So you need electrons in orbitals by themselves to be magnetic. That's one reason why iron is so magnetic because it has three unpaired electrons in orbitals by themselves. When you have unpaired electrons, it's the spin of the electrons in uh, by themselves that actually creates a magnetic field. And so when you have bunch of magnetic fields generated and they're all the same, they, they are additive. And so basically I have electrons spinning in this direction and the next electron spinning in the same direction and the next electron spinning in the same direction. That gives a larger uh, attraction to magnetic field. So you need unpaired electrons in their own orbital for something to be magnetic. When everything is paired, then that means that that is not magnetic. It is not attractive to the magnetic field. And we call those diamagnetic. They do not, they're not attractive to the magnetic field. Paramagnetic elements are attractive to a magnetic field. So what we're going to do here, this is basically one of the main reasons why um, the molecular orbital theory uh, was developed because oxygen, if you look at oxygen, oxygen forms um, uh, a single bond and a pi bond. So it has a sigma bond, it has a pi bond, and it has two lone pairs. So it looks like this, right? So we've got Oxygen is a lone, two lone pairs in each atom, a sigma bond and a pi bond. Everybody's paired, right? According to um, our atomic theory. This is paired, 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 this is paired. They're all paired. So oxygen shouldn't be magnetic, but it is. Oxygen is magnetic. If you pour liquid oxygen between, a, uh, between the poles of a magnet, it will be attractive to the magnet, that shouldn't happen. That basically that was impossible with the atomic 
uh, theory. Something had to be done. That's why the molecular orbital theory was developed, to try and explain what the hell's going on here. So if you draw, whoops, if you draw an orbital, a molecular orbital diagram of the oxygen molecule, you will see that it has two unpaired um, electrons in, in, in uh, uh, pi orbitals. They're unpaired. So they're, so they're by themselves and explains why it's magnetic. So here, let's start over and look at F2, F2 plus, and F2 minus. And we'll see, so the question is, which one of these three is the strongest? So by strongest, what, how, what are we going to, to um, calculate to determine bond strength? What is it we're going to try and figure out to tell us which of these three has the strongest bond? So we're going to calculate something. What, what, what is it? Bond order. Right, John. Bond order. Whoever has the, the highest bond order has the greatest bond strength. So a single bond, a double bond is stronger than a single bond. A triple bond is stronger than a double bond. But as I pointed out, a pi bond isn't as strong as a sigma. So a double bond isn't twice as strong as a, as a single bond. It's slightly less than double. And a triple bond is less than triple the strength of a single bond because pi bonds aren't as, aren't as, aren't as strong because the, the electrons aren't as close together. So let's start with, with uh, F2, fluorine. How many electrons, valence electrons, does fluorine have? Seven. Seven. So we're gonna have seven on this side and seven on this side. So where do we where do we put our seven? Two on one s, two on two s. Mm -hmm. That's four. Thank and then one on each of the two. Oh wait a minute! Oops, oops. One s is here. You really even shouldn't have one S here. We want, because actually, yeah, this is a problem. We only want, we only want the um, valence electrons. We should start with two S. Because actually, fluorine is a total of nine electrons. Yeah, this is messed up. I should have spotted that earlier, but I didn't. So what is the total of nine electrons? These two are not bonded. We shouldn't be including. That's, an, that's messed up. Okay, so I apologize. So seven, it has seven electrons. We're, go we're going to ignore this part down here. That's a mistake. Okay, so seven. So we've got, so remember, only valence electrons are involved in bonding. So I've got one, two, and I've got five left. Where do my next five go? Um, two on two px, two on two py, and one on two pz. Right. So, one, two, three, four, five. So now I'm going to start making bonds, making molecular orbitals out of these. So I've got a total of fourteen electrons to fill in here. So, where am I going to put them? Where did my first two go? Two S sigma. Mm hmm. One. Then two, two S sigma star. Yep. One, two. Then two P sigma. Mm hmm. One, two. Then two on each, um, two P pi. One, two, three, four. So that gives me two. Four, six, eight, ten. I got uh, two left. Four left. And then two on two p pi star. One, two, three, four. Okay. So now we count up all of the bonding electrons and all the anti-bonding electrons. 
So how many bonding electrons do I have? Eight. And that's two. Oops, let me make that a little bit bigger. I got two, four, six, eight. Right, I got eight bonding. And how many anti-bonding do I have? Six. Six. So I got in so we're looking in the star. So in the star orbital, so I got one, two, three. I got six, total of six. So I have a total of two bonding electrons. I have a net of two bonding electrons. Now I divide that by two, and what's my bond order for F2 going to be? One. One, exactly. So here's my first one. I got F2, and my bond order is one. So now look, look at F2 plus two. So now I've got F plus over here and F plus over here. How many valence electrons is F plus going to have? Six. Six, right. Six here, six there. So when we put our valence electrons into the atomic orbitals, we go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just like oxygen, right? Oxygen has six. So this is, so this is basically going to be what an, what an O2 molecule would look like. So let's start putting in our um, molecular orbitals. So now I've got a total of 12. I've got six over here. I've got six over here. So I have a total of 12 electrons to put in. So what, what a... Where do my first two go? Where do they always go? 2s sigma. Yep. One, two. My next two? 2s sigma star. Yep. One, two. Uh, two p sigma. Mm hmm. One, two. Now I got six left. Um, Four on pi, two p. One, two, three, four. And I got two left. Where did this last two go? One on each of the pi star. Right. Now this is where, now remember I mentioned the whole reason this was, well, one of the main reasons this whole theory was developed was because of, you know, oxygen stupidly being magnetic and it wasn't supposed to. Well, this is what O2 would look like. And because it has a total of 12, valence electrons in O2. Now, in the, in the atomic orbital theory, remember I said all of the electrons are, are paired. Four lone pairs, they're paired. Sigma bond, it's paired. Pi bond, it's paired too. Everybody's paired. But in the molecular orbital theory, look, I've got two unpaired electrons in the sigma star antibonding orbitals. They're unpaired and explain why oxygen's magnetic when it wasn't supposed to be. So F, F2 plus 2 should also be magnetic as well. So let's figure out what its bond order is. How many total electrons do we have in bonding orbitals? Count them up. Eight. So I've got two, four, six, eight. Right, I've got eight bonding. And how many anti bonding? Four. Four. Two, three, four. So I've got four electrons bonding. I divide that by two for electrons per bond. And what's my bond order going to be? Two. Two. So my bond order is two. So that's so just that also explains why oxygen 
as a double bond in this, in this particular theory. Its bond order would be two, which is correct. So F2 is a bond order of one, and we know that that's true, right? Because if I have a fluorine molecule, it has a single sigma bond. So that's true. If I was to take two electrons away, it would actually form a double bond for a bond order of two. Let's see what happens if I make it two minus, if it becomes an anion. Now I'm adding two electrons. So if I were to add two electrons, I would have F minus plus F minus making a molecule. How many valence electrons does F minus have? Eight. Eight, right. F minus is a complete set as an octet. It has eight. So I'd have eight here, and I would have eight here. And so because it has eight, all its orbitals are filled, right? That's what having an octet means. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're all filled. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have a complete octet. What do you suspect the bond order of two atoms that have a complete octet are going to be? Are they going to form any bonds? No. Probably not, right? I mean, just think, so F minus fluoride ion has the same electron configuration as neon. Does neon form any bonds with another neon atom? No. Doesn't, right? Let's see. So I have a total of 16 valence electrons to fill in my molecular orbital. So let's start doing it. Where do my first two, as usual, go here? One, two, three, four. And where do my next ones go? I got 12 left. 2p sigma. Mm hmm One, two. And the next, so I got 10 left. 4 on 2p pi. One, two, three, four. All right, I got 6 left. And then you just fill the rest of them. So six, I got one, two, three, four. I got two left, one, two. So they're all completely filled. So what does that give us? Let's count the number of bonding electrons. How many bonding electrons do I have? Eight. Oh, eight. eight. So one, so two, four, six. Eight. So I have eight bonding electrons. How many non-bonding or anti-bonding electrons do I have? Eight. I also have eight. So there's two, four, six, eight. So what's my bond order? Um, zero. Zero. Meaning it does not form. So when I have a bond order of zero, that means no bonding. So what is the, so F2 Minus two is a bond order of none. So which one is the, has the strongest bond? Uh, F2 plus? Yep, so F2 two plus would have the strongest bond, followed by? by F2. F2, right, followed by? Uh, F, F2 minus. F2, two minus, right, that's it. So hopefully that's, that's helpful. So for as far as the rest of them, I'll give you, let's say, I don't know, half an hour to work on them in groups, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Does anybody have any questions before we do that? I didn't, re I had trouble knowing what was new and what wasn't. So I'm kind of glad we, we, we went through some of this. So hopefully you want because I know there's, there's some questions about um, magnetism in there, which would have been tough to do. Any, any questions before we split off for a while? We can't hear you now.
again. Oh, well, not. I, maybe but we can't. Sounds like I need to shout. I'm going to look in to see what's what's going on. I might, I might just have to buy a microphone because this is this is happening a lot. So the, before the computer was working just fine. Now it doesn't. Now it seems like a problem. So I'll put. Oh, we can't hear you. We just lost you. Are you like us? <laughs> Okay, what about now? Yeah. That's much better. Much better. All right, I'm just gonna not yeah, use it's better. I'm just gonna not use this stupid earphone anymore. Maybe that maybe that was my problem. <laughs> maybe there's something wrong with, with, with that. Okay. So um, I'll put people in just in, into like a couple rooms. I'll I'll come around, see how you're doing. Make sure you make sure you're sharing. I will ensure that you can share screens. And, um, oh, do we have our TA today? Yes, I'm here. Oh, you're here. All right, good. I'll make you the co-host. I keep forgetting to do that. Can you also remember to let us share screen? Yes, I just did. Okay. Yep. Okay. And there you go. Uh, professor, yes. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure, because uh, it's kind of it's been a while for me. Uh, for yeah, me too. I because do. <laughs> I don't do this too much in OCHEM, mm -hmm. so I I kind of just don't remember. Okay. So, um, uh, I mean, just going back to the when you were talking about the pi orbitals, where it mm -hmm. has the three planes. I right. know that when you have a sigma bond, because it kind of overlaps with that x. Uh, plane, so right. the, that space is pretty much gone. Right, then, it, because it's 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 the um, it's the x, uh, it's the px orbital that actually forms the the um, the hybridized uh, orbital. So if you if you're if you're hybridizing um, sp, for instance, you take the s and you hybridize the px to it. If you're making uh, sp two you take the X and the Y and you hybridize those. And if you're making SP3, you hybridize all three of them. Okay, but then like if you have a um, double bond versus mm -hmm. a triple bond, yep. um, in a double bond, are you only using two planes or yes. are you using all three? Yes, you use, well, you're using one plane. So that's why, uh, that's why a, um, a, a double bond is planar. Right, because the the the, act, the 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 sigma bond is directly between the two atoms, and then the pi bond is both above and below the plane. So in in the x-axis, so it's both above, or I'm sorry, y. It's 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 the y. So it's above the x and below the x, but completely planar. But then, like, I guess um, in a triple bond. The electron density. There's more electron density in the in those um, orbitals, whereas um, in the double bond, there's less electron density, but it's still like spread like above and and below, right? Well, the same the same is true with a triple. So in the so the, you have the single bond in into so the sigmas directly in between the two. The right. first uh, pi bond is above and below, and the second pi bond comes out. And then behind. Oh, okay. So it's, I guess that's in the third plane. In the yes. Plane. Yeah. Okay. It's, that it's, makes sense. It's it's three dimensional because it's above and below and in, out, and behind. So that's why it looks linear because basically it's it looks like a hot dog bun where you've got elect you've got electrons on top and on bottom on the front and the and the back and in between. So it's, mm -hmm. it looks it looks flat. Okay, just to just to double check, there's no there's no z plane in a double bond, right? Well, like there's no third plane coming in or out because 
Well, yeah, well, the, 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 the Z plane is, is, is front and, be and behind. So X is between them, Y is above and below, and Z comes in and out. So it's not, I mean, it's there, but it's not used, right? Like in a benzene, I guess. Well, in, in yeah, benzene, benzene is flat because you're only going above and, and below. You're not forming a triple bond. Okay, anyway. okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Right, no problem, man. I'm gonna go check on them. Yeah, no. I'm gonna just run to the bathroom. I'll be right back. All right. Let's see if I can draw on this as well. How do I do that? I want to draw too. If you press the top where it says um, the screen, and then you, it says view options. Oh, there's annotate. Yep, got it. All right. All right, so I've got, so normally carbon has the one, two, three, four um, valence electrons, right? So when it goes to sp2, it then puts three of those electrons in sp2, so one, two, three, and then it has one left over, and that goes into a p orbital. So remember I mentioned that all sigma bonds, all of them, are made with hybridized orbitals. So it's got a sigma here, it's got a sigma here, and it's got a sigma there. So it takes an electron, it takes a single electron from from oxygen, that's the sigma bond from oxygen. It takes two um, electrons from hydrogen, one, two, and then it has a P electron left. It hybridizes that P electron with a P electron from oxygen and forms, when you have two P electrons, what kind of, and they overlap, what kind of bond is that? Pi. That's a pi bond, exactly. That's a pi bond. And so what you'll find is that this oxygen here is also sp2 hybridized. Where do, where do its electrons go? It has six electrons, right? So six electrons, one, two, three, four. So it has sp2 and a p. So it's six electrons go one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sp2 electron that it hybridizes with the sp2 electron from the carbon to make this sigma bond because they're both hybridized orbitals. And this is the p electron that it hybridizes with this p electron from carbon to make the pi bond. And then the other two electrons, the other sp2 electrons, what are they? Notice I've got a pair and a pair. Where do you, what do you think those are? Sigma bonds? Nope. Remember, it only forms two bonds. Carbon and hydrogen and oxygen only form two bonds, one sigma and one pi. But okay. oxygen has these other four electrons left over. Where, where do those go? They're the lone pairs. Those are the lone pairs, exactly. One, two, those are the lone pairs, precisely. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, any other questions? No, I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right, I'll, I'll see you in a little while. Oh, you, get, you only get two people in here. Wow. Yes. How did that? <laughs> everyone, everyone ran away. So you, oh, no, we actually had, we actually had um, someone else in here. I think he left. <laughs> oh, no, that's not good. So any, any questions so far? Some folks were asking about this diagram 
oops, I'm going to try and write on there as well. Some folks were asking about this diagram here. Yeah, don't, don't worry about that as, as far as figuring out what's magnetic and what isn't. It's just showing you that as you put more and more electrons into p orbitals, as you go across the periodic table, that those orbitals become, have more energy in them. And so you get a difference in their relative energies as you go across the periodic table due to something called SP mixing, but I don't know if that's something that you are going to be responsible for. Is, I don't, is, that, is that a new thing, SP mixing? Has that even been mentioned in any of the lectures? No. Yeah, it's, it, for me. yeah, it's 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 not a it's not a big deal. It just basically it just the relative energies of these molecular orbitals changes somewhat. But as far as filling them in and seeing um, what the bond orders are and whether or not they're magnetic, it makes no difference at all. So, like that, yeah. The, so having that there is kind of confusing. <laughs> So you're just, you're, you're figuring out the, the magnetism of each one now? We're that, trying. <laughs> what's that? We're trying. Oh, you're just playing? <laughs> okay. What, what, what are you playing at then? You're playing tic-tac-toe with, with molecular orbitals? That might be a fun game. <laughs> so what, what question are you working on? Um, we're working on uh, 3D. 3D. Oh, okay, with nitrogen. So, you, right, so you get your five over here and your five over here. Right, so yeah, so just, so you got 10 electrons to, 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 to play with. Just put them in it as, as, as you would normally. So where, where, do, where do you start by putting in your, your 10? I, I think here. Yep, yep. So put, put two in there. Okay. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Ruby. Okay. That's better. <laughs> so now you got eight left. So keep keep going. Right here. Nope. Uh -huh. So the first two go in here. Second two go in here in the in the uh sigma star oh so remember you just go just go up the just go up the table you start at the lowest point and then you just go up so the next two go in sigma star yep mm -hmm. so you've got six left and then one uh two here two here two here Nope. So remember, each each orbital has two, has room for two electrons. So you would go one. Two here and two here. Yep. One, two, three, four in the pi, in the pi orbitals. Yep. For a total of four. There's two orbitals there with two electrons in each one. If we blew this up, it might, might be easier. No, I can't. I can't blow it up. Ruby. Oh, sorry. Yeah, can you drag that? Just, just make it a little bit bigger. Uh, how do I do that? Just click on mouse, and then just take your fingers and just. Pull them apart on it to see if you can make the make the screen bigger. Whoops. Oh. Uh -uh. No. So just put in there, like on the on, on the screen, and just pull pull them apart. Does that make it bigger? Or you all all, all you can do is just scroll. Yeah. Oh, okay. So 
So you'd have four going into the pi star. Okay, I, I, I can try. Um, <laughs> okay, two here. Oh, yeah. And two here. And actually, there should be two in the P sigma as well above that. Okay. Two here, one and one. So you have a sigma 2p. There's a sigma 2s. Okay. There's a sigma 2s star. Then there's a sigma 2p. Okay. And then a pi 2p above that. It'd be easier to see if you could. Here, I'll just draw on the one above it. Okay. So it's one. Oh. Damn it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you can see that, so when we look at the bond order, I've got two, four, six, eight in bonding orbitals. And I've only got two in non-bonding orbitals. So if I divide that by two, I get a bond order of three. And that's what you see with nitrogen, right? You have nitrogen, triple bond, nitrogen. So would it be magnetic or, or non-magnetic? Magnetic. Now, what, what, what do you need? What do the electrons need to be to be magnetic? Um, paired or unpaired? Which, which, kind of mag, which kind of electrons are, are, give um, a pair of magnetism to, like being attracted to a, to a magnetic field? Are they, when you have paired electrons, are they magnetic or when you have unpaired electrons, are they magnetic? Uh, I, mag I mean, unpaired. Unpaired, right. Because when they're unpaired, you have more electrons spinning in one direction than the other. When they're all paired, you have exactly the same number of electrons pointing up as they're pointing down. So the net spin is zero. But when you have unpaired electrons, you have a net spin in one direction. That makes it magnetic. So nitrogen, when you look at, when you look at the molecular orbitals, they're all filled. They're all, all the electrons are paired. And so it's going to be diamagnetic. It's not going to be magnetic. Okay. 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 Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions for it? Have you you've you've started working on on the hybridization problems? Not yet. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you a couple minutes, and then we'll 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 come back and and start to go over those. Okay. Okay. All right. See you in a little while. Under flooring, a little high. All right. How's everyone doing here? Oh, you got your bond orders. Excellent. Did you figure out whether they were magnetic or not? Uh, so we yeah. kind of, sorry, you could go. <laughs> no, 
So what, what does it take for, for, for molecules to be magnetic? Um, it's, it's depend um, on, the, on the highness uh, orbital. And if there is, has a odd number electron and it will be dire. It's not an odd number of electrons. It's not the fact whether they're even or odd. It's um, what di dictates whether or not a, a, an atom or a molecule is, is magnetic. What is it about it that determines its magnetism? Um, there is a one uh, long electron on this and it will make, makes the element goes magnetic. Well, when you say lone electron, what, is, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, it's, it's not just lone. There's a very specific thing you want to, because it could have more than one lone electron and still be magnetic. What is it about those electrons specifically that makes them magnetic? Uh, You're close with the, with the lone. You're onto something there. Are you talking about uh, lone balance el electrons on the outer shell, or the the highest? What do you mean by unbalanced? What do you mean by unbalanced? I think that's sort of sort of close to what I'm getting at as well. On the um, highest or last orbital. So what does it mean to be unbalanced? It doesn't have a paired. Um, unpaired. Yes, that's that's the whole that's the whole point. Yes, unpaired. So lone. I think what you what you meant was unpaired, and that's exactly what it is. So the more unpaired electrons you have, the more magnetic you'll be. Like iron has three unpaired electrons in its outermost shell, so it's very magnetic. Um, some of the rare earth metals have even more unpaired electrons, so they're super, super magnetic. But if all your electrons are paired inside orbitals, then they basically have no net spin because they have the same number of electrons spinning this way and the same number of spinning that way. So there's no net spin. And if there's no net spin, that means they're, they're diamagnetic. They're actually slightly repelled by a magnetic field rather, rather than attracted. So uh, nitrogen, for instance, if you notice nitrogen had 10, right? Total of 10, um, 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 uh, valence electrons. And when you put them all into their orbitals, they were all placed into orb orbits in pairs. So, right, you had eight in, in bonding orbitals and you had two in non-bonding orbitals. That's why you have a, your, your uh, bond order of three. But they were all paired. And so nitrogen is not magnetic. But oxygen also has an even number of, of electrons. It is 12. But since it, it now takes those 10 electrons and then it puts two more into non-bonding orbitals, one into one non-bonding orbital and another one into a degenerate non-bonding orbital of the same energy that aren't paired. And so that's why it's magnetic. So oxygen in your case would be para? Yep. I see. Yep, because the, the additional two um, um, electrons that it has over nitrogen both go into sigma star PY and sigma star PZ. And so they're separated from each other. They're in different orbitals. Hey, dogs want to go for a walk. Jerome. So since they're split from each other, they're spinning in the same direction and it gives O2 a net spin. So this particular uh, diagram is a little confusing because it's showing you the relative energies of, of the different molecular orbitals. And that changes as you put more and more and more electrons into P orbitals, the relative energies change, but that's not important for determining bond order or magnetism. It's, so it's a little confusing. I don't know if you're gonna actually deal with, with this particular thing in, in class or not. I kind of doubt it. It's a little more advanced, but.
it's something it's something to be aware of, I guess. Yeah, to ask 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 the professor if you're going to be dealing with something called SP mixing. That's what this diagram is about. I don't think we go into it much in, in 210. 220, I think they, they deal with it a little a little more. So have you guys started working on the hybridization problems? No, yeah, we we just doing the determine the paro or diametric. Okay, I'll finally just give everyone like another ten minutes, and then we'll we'll come back and work on the hybridization problems. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. So. Oh man, you're getting down, getting down to the end here. So then would this one have no pi bones, both of these? Well, have a look at the carbon number one. The fr look at all the different carbons. Notice the, the carbon on the far left has only three bonds. And the next one to it is only three bonds. And then the third carbon, the carbon in the middle is only three bonds. And the carbon at the end is only two. So there's a problem, right? Because carbon should have how many bonds? Four. Four. Carbon should always, well, not always, but like 95% of the time, carbon makes four bonds. So you need to add some, some bonds in there. Same, same with the same with the um, same with the top one. Notice that the middle carbon is only forming three bonds. So you have to fill in. So those those um, those pictures are incomplete. They don't have all the. You need to fill in the double bonds and lone pairs. Oh. Oh yeah. But would it still be? Wait. Would it, are you adding, are you just adding? pairs on carbon and carbon does not like to have lone pairs. Oh, so you uh, would a double bond with carbon and oxygen? On the top? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the middle carbon forms a double bond with one of those oxygens and a single bond with the other. See which, which, which is which? Like that? So then that oxygen would have three bonds. How many bonds does oxygen normally make? Um, two. Right, oxygen normally makes two bonds and has two lone pairs because <clears throat> it has six valence electrons. So to get eight, it just needs to make two more bonds. So oxygen is gonna make two bonds and have two lone pairs. And that's true for both of those oxygens in that there you go. So oxygen one is going to have a double bond. Oxygen two is just going to have a single on one side and a single on the other side and two lone pairs. Yeah, so this one is wrong, right? Which one? This one. Right here, because there's two bonds there. Mm -hmm. How many is it going to take? It's just going to leave, just have one, right? Nope. No, you had it right. You had it right. It takes three, actually. Wait, no, 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 not that one. On the top, between three and two, there's two. Between three and two is going to be a single bond. Yes. Because carbon makes four bonds and oxygen makes two. So oxygen number two is going to have two single bonds, one with carbon, the other with hydrogen, and have two lone pairs. So the only thing you had to add to oxygen two is the two lone pairs. So I was going to have everyone come back at three, and then we'll and then we'll review the rest of these. Does that sound good? Uh, actually, I actually go at three. Okay. Is that okay? If you gotta go, you gotta go.
We don't. You too. Stop it. Yeah. So on the bottom, yeah, that's that's right. So carbon three is going to have four bonds, and you gave gave it four bonds. The middle carbon now has four bonds, and the carbon on the right also has four bonds. But you're missing a lone pair. Where does the lone pair go on the bottom? A nitrogen. Yes, because nitrogen has three bonds and two electrons left over for a single lone pair. Yeah, because nitrogen is five valence electrons, so it makes one, two, three bonds to get to eight total electrons. And it has a lone pair left over. Bill, stop gnawing on my foot. All right, so I'm just going to have everyone come back at, at three, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll review this together, okay? All right, we'll see you in a minute. I think it has six sigma bonds, right? Okay. So, um, Hybridization. I don't know how much work on hybridization um, everybody's been doing, but I figured we, we, we would go over um, this part before uh, calling it a day. So um, how much work have you guys done with like hybridized orbitals, SP, SP2, SP3? Have you been working on that for a while? Um, we, for, at least for myself, I only watched about one or two videos on that. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of rusty. Okay. So we, okay, fair enough. So we have in, uh, in the other, other like the optional classes, have you been uh, doing them there? No, I haven't. Okay. So let's talk about it a little bit. So um, unhybridized, hybridized. So the whole point of hybridization um, came about. We can just look at carbon uh, in, in particular. Carbon has how many, how many, uh, yeah, how many high, yeah, listen, I can't even talk at this point. How many um, electrons does this have involved in bonding? How many valence <gasps> electrons? And this four? Four, right. So if we were to put them in the unhybridized <laughs> orbitals, we would go one, two, three, Four, right? So, but when we make, uh, let me just skip ahead here. If we were to make methane, for instance, with those four electrons, so here's my four electrons. So I've got two and two S and two and two P. So you remember, so this is, so this would be my carbon. So I'd have two electrons in S, which we know goes around in a circle. So we'd have electron there, an electron some, somewhere around there, but, but in a circle. And P, I'd have an electron here, and I'd have an electron here. And so the shape of uh, CH4, when it was time to bond with, um, with hydrogen, well, there'd only be two hydrogens it could bond with, right? Because these two electrons are paired. They're not gonna, they're already paired. They're not gonna want to, to bond with anybody. So one hydrogen would bond with this electron and the other hydrogen would bond with that electron. And there'd be no, there'd be no space for the other two electrons to bond. There'd be no electrons for them to bind to. And if they did, the shape would not look like this. Because from this, we would, we would say that this, was, this should be linear, right? Because this electron should be as far away from this electron as, as, as possible. So this would be linear in some way. But we know that's not true. We know that it actually looks like this, right? So here's our carbon. There's hydrogen coming out. 
Here's a hydrogen going away, one here and one there. And it's a tetrahedral shape. Hydrogen, 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 and our carbon in the middle. And these bond angles are 109 degrees. They're all the same. So each one of the electrons, each one of the valence electrons from carbon have to be the same, right? In order, for, in order to form this structure, all four valence electrons from carbon have to be identical. And that doesn't make any sense if we know that like two of them are in S and I've got two of them in P. That can't be. So how do we explain that? So the way we explain that is that we must form some sort of hybridized orbital rather than just having some S um, uh, character and some P character, it must have a little bit of both. And so what we do is actually describe that as having orbitals that look like this. So instead of an S and a P, they all look a little bit more like both of them. So it looks like this, let me change colors to one, two, three, four. So there's a little bit of S on this side and more P on that side. So they sort of take both shapes. So kind of like this. So that's what an SP orbital would look like. And that since you have four of them, one, two, three, four, the shape they're gonna take is to try and get as far away from each other as possible. And the shape that is, is the pyramid with bond angles of 109 degrees. So let's go back and look and see what that looks like when we actually draw that out. So again, here's our one, two, three, four electrons. So what happens is that I need four enough. Excuse me. So I need four places to put electrons that are all the same. So what, so what we do is we take this one S orbital and these three P orbitals and we combine them together to form S P three, because there's one S and there's three P orbitals. And then we put one, two, three, four electrons into each one. So now I have four electrons that are all the same energy and they're all unpaired. That's also critical because remember I had these, the two S electrons were paired. There's no reason for them to form a bond. They're already paired. But carbon doesn't have any lone pairs. It makes four bonds. And so how it makes four bonds and, and how it makes four sigma bonds is it forms an sp3. So then the th four hydrogen um, electrons would go here. Whoop, sorry. Here's my one. Yeah. Ah. So hydrogen electrons, one, two, three, four. And now they're all paired. Okay. Now, what about if you have um, SP2 or SP or SP? You figure out that by figuring, you determine whether you have SP3, SP2, or SP hybridization by figuring out how many areas, how many electron areas do you have around the atom? So with CH4, carbon had four regions of electron density around it. It had four bonds, right? So it needed four electrons to do that, SP3. Now, if carbon looks like this, So that's ethene. How many electron regions are around each carbon now? 
five? Nope. One, two, three, four. Regions of electron density. Oh, three, three. Yeah. Three, right. Remember when we were doing shapes, we were talking about regions of electron density. So regions of electron density just mean how many areas have electrons in them. So when I have two single bonds and a double bond, that's three regions of electron density. So three regions of electron density, I need three equivalent electrons, sp2. And if I have this, then how many regions of electron density are around each carbon now? Two. Just two. So I need two equivalent electrons. I just need sp, okay? Now I will show you how that, how that works. But so now we're gonna deal with the, with the oxygen. So we're dealing with this oxygen right here. So first, um, for unhybridized oxygen, I've got S and P. So S, one, two, three. How many um, valence electrons does oxygen have? Six. Six. So I'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, six right? Yes. So um, according to this, I would make two bonds and have two lone pairs. And that's true, right? I've got a lone pair. I've got one lone pair, two lone pairs, one, two bonds. Problem is my two lone pairs are different energies. Two are in P and two are in S. And these have to be the same energy. So what am I gonna do to fix that? How many regions of electron density are around this oxygen? Could you repeat the question again? How many regions of electron density are around that oxygen? Uh, well, there's four. Four, right. Four. Yeah. There's a bond here, and there's a bond there, and there's a lone pair here and a lone pair there for a total of four. So if I need four regions of electron density, what um, hybridization am I going to use for that? It is sp3. sp3, right sort of gives it away there. But yeah, there's four regions of electron density, so I need sp3. So one, two, three, four, my four regions of density, those are sp3. And how many valence electrons does oxygen have to put in those orbitals? Well, one, two, three, four, six. Six, so we use the same rules as we do for, for regular orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now you remember, what kind of orbitals make sigma bonds? Hybridized orbitals or unhybridized orbitals? Uh, high, hybridized orbitals. Hybridized orbitals, right. The only one that doesn't is, is uh, hydrogen because it only has S, it can't, it can't make any hybridized. It only has a single electron. So everybody else uses hybridized orbitals to make sigma bonds. Well, here are the two orbitals that you put the sigma bonds in. So I've got a hydrogen here. So that's where that electron goes. And I've got a carbon sp3 electron that goes there. And so now I've got one, two sigma bonds, and one, two lone pairs. One, two lone pairs. And those two lone pairs have the same energy now. And it also, so how many sigma bonds will be formed around this oxygen? There's two. Two. How are the other sp3 orbitals used? There's on, uh, only two. Oh. So what are in the other sp3 orbitals? I've got a sigma bond here and a sigma bond here. What are these other two used oh. for? It's lone, lone pairs. Lone pairs, exactly. 
And the other nice thing about uh, the hybridized model, it tells you what the shape is going to be. It tells you what the bond angles are going to be. So what do you think this bond angle is going to be around this bond angle right here? This carbon, oxygen, hydrogen bond. Uh, what is that angle going to be? 100 twenty. Nope. No, that would be if there was three. So if you have three regions, they'd be separated by 120. We have four regions. Oh, we have one, two, three, four. 90 degree? Mm, not 90, because this, remember, this is in three dimensions. Oh. This isn't planar. When you have four regions, remember that's tetrahedral. Yeah. They're... Remember what the bond angles were for a tetrahedral shape? Yes. Uh, 109. Yeah, around 109. Yeah. But actually, that angle is going to be a little bit less because we have one, two, three. We have these two lone pairs there. Yeah. And the two lone pairs actually make yeah. this bond angle a little bit smaller. So it's going to be smaller than 109. But it'll be around it'll be around 109 but a little bit smaller because of the lone pairs mm -hmm. okay so let's move on to the next one so here we have um oops let me go back yeah so in this instance we've got This molecule. So what are going to be the hybridizations for carbon this time? How many regions of electron density are around carbon now? Three. Three. One, two, two three. Three. Right. So because we have three regions, what hybridization do we need? Um, the S SP2. Right. SP2. So unhybridized, as usual, I have one, two, three, four. But I have three regions of electrons, of electron density. So I need sp2. So I'm going to put one electron into each one. So one, two, three. And I'm going to have, where's my fourth electron go? So maybe on the P? In the P, right. So notice, because there's three regions of electron density, how many sigma bonds am I going to make? Uh, four. Nope. Oh, three, three, three. Three, right. Yeah. yeah, three. All single bonds are sigma bonds, all of them. So it's only making three single bonds, right? And my three single bonds are one, two, three. Mm -hmm. I'm making one, so this is a sigma bond. That's a sigma bond. That's a sigma bond. What's this fourth bond? Um, is the Remember, bond? every single bond is a sigma bond. Any bond after that is not sigma, but It is a electric bond. I mean, it's a normal electric bond. Somebody help him. There's two kinds of bonds, yeah. sigma and what's the other kind? Is a pi bond? It's pi, there you go. Right, so this, so this, if you have a double bond, it's one sigma plus one pi. If you uh -huh. have a triple bond, it's one sigma plus one pi plus another pi bond. So there's only sigma and pi, that's it. Okay. Sigma bonds are made from hybridized orbitals. So my three electrons to fill those orbitals, one that's going to come from this hydrogen. There's one. The other is going to come from this hydrogen. That's two. And the third one is going to come from this oxygen. What's going to be the hybridization around that oxygen? Right. 
How many regions of electron density around that oxygen? Three, one. Also three, that's right. Yeah, so what's its hybridization gonna be? Uh, is S also sp2. Exactly, it'll be sp2 as well. And so this third electron will be from sp2 from oxygen. And then where's, what happens with this single p electron? So that's carbon single p electron. What happens to that? Um, it will. Connect to the connect with the uh, oxygen, right? Yeah. What? So oxygen has, so it's got it's sp two hybridized. So meaning it has, it has one more uh, p. Exactly. It has yeah. one more p electron left. It has two sp two orbitals. Those are its lone pairs. Uh -huh. is a single sp2 electron that it made this sigma bond and it has one electron left over that's in a pi orbital and so this p electron from the carbon forms a bond with the p electron from the oxygen and that makes a pi bond right so the three hybridized orbitals sigma 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 and the p electron makes a pi so the hybridized orbitals will form three sigma bonds and the unhybridized p or orbital forms a pi bond. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, good job. All right. Um, now this next one got confusing here because there's mistakes <laughs> on here. So let's just fix the mistake, shall we? And then, so, so we've got, here we've got carbon dioxide. So what is gonna be the hybridization on the central carbon? How many regions of electron density are on the central carbon? It's on, only two. Only two, right. So what hybridization is that? Uh, is that SP, it's only SP1? G just sp yeah we just call it sp sp so right so it has two sp orbitals so there should be just a single electron in that one and a single electron in that one and then it leaves two electrons left over so one goes into the this p orbital and one goes into that p orbital so that's what that should look like now oxygen um has three regions of electron density so it's sp2 yeah and those are correct so one so there's a lone pair there's a lone pair there's a sigma whoops there's a sigma binding um, electron and there's a pi binding electron lone pair lone pair sigma pi so we put them into molecular orbitals we have a six plus four plus six, that's 16 um, electrons. And yeah, I don't know what they're, <laughs> I don't know what they're getting at with, 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 the, with the molecular orbitals. But anyway, um, what this shows you is that with the sp orbital, the carbon in the middle since it has one, two, three, four. These two make sigma bonds between, between the oxygens. So this hybridized um, electron with oxygen one forms a bond with that hybridized um, carbon um, to make a sigma. This hybridized oxygen electron joins with that hybridized electron from carbon to make another sigma. And then this pi, this p electron from oxygen bonds with this p electron. And this p electron from oxygen forms 
a bond with that P. So you get one, two sigmas and two, two pi's. And that's why, that's, so that's why you have two double bonds. So you have a sigma and a pi on one side and a sigma and a pi on the other side. Okay. Mm, okay. Yeah. The rest of it is, I it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's confusing. So I was going to, oops. So just, yeah. So before we go, let's just, um, review. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Yeah, this one was confusing to people. So let's sort of do that one. So with this question, um, not all of the um, bonds and loan pairs were there. So you needed to you needed to add them. So this first one, the acetic acid, which atoms need loan pairs and which need more bonds. So it basically shows you that the, the two oxygens and the carbon, carbon number three are incomplete and we need to add something to them. So how are we going to complete them? So carbon generally has how many bonds? There's only three bonds. We need to add one more bond. Right. So carbon usually has four bonds and no lone pairs. And oxygen normally has how many bonds and how many lone pairs? Uh, always have two lone pair and uh, two bond. Right. Right, exactly. So let's just put the lone pairs on the oxygens then, shall we? Because they both need two. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that gives oxygen two, uh, it's two bonds and it's two lone pairs. So oxygen two is fine. What about oxygen one? O oxygen one need one more bond. Yep, it certainly does. And notice that also gives carbon the four bonds it needs. So that's what was missing. So what's the total number of sigma bonds in this particular um, structure? Uh, sigma bonds have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Right. All the single bonds are sigma bonds. So basically you just, just add up the lines and it's one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven. And how many pi bonds? One, only one. One. So oxygen one, oxygen two, and carbon three. What's the hybridization on um, carbon three? Carbon three is? How many regions of electron density are around carbon three? Carbon three has three. Mm hmm three, three regions. Yep. Um, so it is uh, sp2. Yep, exactly. So that would be sp2 hybridized. And if it's sp2 hybridized, that means you have three regions. So what shape would you get when you have three regions of electron density? Uh, uh, tetrahedron. Nope, that's with four regions. Oh, there's four regions. Yep. So it's pyrimidical. So if you have three regions of density, what's what's the angle that get, gives them the greatest distance from each other? One hundred and twenty degrees. Exactly. One hundred and twenty. Yep. So it won't be quite 120 because you have oxygens there sort of pushing things around, but it'll be around 120. Now, what about oxygen two? How many regions of electron density are around oxygen two? Uh, uh, we got four. Four. Uh, four, right. So what hybridization would that be? Uh, SP3. Yep, SP3. And what's the angle to give you the greatest distance between four regions? Mm, 109 degree. Yep. Yep, around 109.5, exactly. Now oxygen one, this one right here. 
how many regions around oxygen one? It's three. Mm -hmm. um, so what hybridization? That's P2. Yep. And the ball angle is uh, 120. Yep, around 120, exactly. Excellent. Now, somebody else want to help out with the second one, the acrylonitrile? How many bonds does carbon three need? You need one more bond. Amanda, what's what 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 say you? Or Ruby? Anyway. Hey! Man, they want to go outside. So carbon three, how many bonds does it need? Yes, I know. Mary, you want to help out? Four. Four. It needs four, right? So where's the fourth bond going to go? Can I add another one to a hydrogen? No. Nope. So we're, it's really only one place it can go. Who, who, who's going to, where's it going to bond? Where's it going to put a second bond with? Uh, other carbon next to it? Yeah, the carbon next to it, exactly. It's the only place it can go because it can't form another bond with hydrogen. So we're going to put an extra bond there. So what about the carbon in the middle? Does it need any anything else? How many bonds does it have? It already had uh, four bonds. It has four, so it's good. What about carbon two? How many bonds does it have? right now? Only two. It's only got two, so it needs two more. Or lone pairs, but does carbon usually have lone pairs? No. Nope. Not really. Carbon generally has four bonds and no lone pairs, so what are we gonna do? It has two, so it needs two more. Can I, can I put another bond on the, with the carbon in the middle? No. Nope, because that carbon in the middle already has four bonds, so it doesn't have any electrons left. So if it needs two more bonds, there's only one place I can put them, right? So where are they going to go? To the nitrogen. To the nitrogen, right. One, two. So can nitrogen form three bonds? How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Five. It's five, right? So how many more electrons does it need to get to its happy place, to get to, a, to, get to an octet? Three. It needs three more. So it needs three more. So it gets its three more from bonds. So it, it makes three bonds, and then how many electrons would it have left over? Two. Two, right. So it has five electrons. It uses three of them to make bonds, and it has two left over as a lone pair. So the lone pair would go right here. One, two. So now it has a total of eight. So it has three bonds. That's a total of six electrons and a lone pair for a total of eight. So it's happy, the carbon's happy, now everybody's happy. Now we just need to figure out sigma bonds and our hybridizations. So how many, total, how many sigma bonds total do we have in the acrylonitrile? Remember, all single bonds are sigmas. The three? Well, I count four single bonds. There's one, two, 
three, four. So there's at least four. <clears throat> so each single bond is all sigma bonds, all single bonds are sigma bonds. So that's four. What about the multiple bonds? I have a double and a triple. How many, so in this double bond, how many sigma bonds are there? Two. Remember, every, you can only form one sigma bond between atoms. Every subsequent bond is gonna be a pi bond. So if I have a double bond, how many sigma and how many pi? The first bond is always sigma. Any additional bond is a pi bond. So if that double bond, how many sigma and how many pi do I have? So a single bond is sigma. Double bond is a pi plus what kind of bond? Sigma. Sigma, right. Because the first bond is always sigma. There's always at least one sigma bond. Always, always, always. So if there's a single bond, well, there's only one bond, it has to be sigma, because there always has to be one. If it's a double bond, well, one of them's gotta be a sigma, and the other one is pi. And if it's a triple, again, one of them has to be sigma. And then the next one is a pi, and the third one is a pi as well. Any subsequent bonds are pi's. So in this double bond, there's a sigma plus a pi, and in this triple bond, there's a, a sigma plus two pi. So what's the total number of sigma bonds? Six. Six, right, six. And how many, so basically it's how many atoms are bonded. That's how many sigma bonds there's gonna be. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, wait a minute, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, six, holding those seven together. So there's six sigma bonds. How many pi bonds? Three, three. Three, three. yep. Because there's one in the double, there's one in the double here, and there's two in the triple for a total of three. Right, so for atom number one, that's the nitrogen. What hybridization does that nitrogen have? How many regions of electron density does that nitrogen have? So it goes like this, C11. So it looks like that. How many regions of electron density are around that nitrogen? Just two, that's right. There's a triple bond on one side of it and there's a lone pair on the other side. So there's only two regions of electron density. So what hybridization is that? SP. SP, right, it only needs two. Remember, it, it's only, it only needs two equivalent regions of electrons, it needs two. One to make a sigma bond and the other for this, oh, and the other for that lone pair. So it is sp. What is going to be the, the um, bond angle? If you have sp, what bond angle is that? 180. Yeah, it's linear. It's linear because the greatest distance between that triple bond and the lone pair is 180 degrees. You wanna get them as far away from each other as possible. So that is 180. I don't know where these lines are coming from. All right, number two, that's a carbon two. So how many regions of electron density are around carbon two? So it looks like this. 
So how many regions are, of electron density around that carbon? Two. Also two, right? It's a triple bond on one side and it's got a single bond on the other. Two regions. So it's also two. So what's its hybridization? SP. Also SP hybridized. That is exactly right. Um, so what's its bond angle going to be? Linear 180 degrees. Yep. It's going to be exactly the same, 180 degrees, just like, just like the nitrogen. And carbon-3 has how many regions of electron density around it? So it's, it's, let me erase some of this. Three. Yeah, it also has three. So it has the double bond, that's one. This single bond, two, and this other single bond, three. So it has three regions of electron density. So what hybridization is that? SP2. That's SP2, right. So if you have three regions of electron density, what angle gives you the greatest distance between the three of them? 120 degrees. 120, right. So this carbon and this nitrogen are gonna be linear. And these two carbons are gonna be planar because they're gonna have 120 degrees in between them because they're sp2 hybridized. They'll be planar with 120 degrees in between them. All right, so kept you guys a long time. Any other questions before we go? Do you wanna review anything else before we call it a day? Um, no. <laughs> no, I wanna go home. Fair enough. Of course, you're already home, right? I'm assuming, or you're in your car somewhere, whatever. All right. So, if, does anyone else have any have any questions before we wrap it up? Oh yeah, and Benjamin is a, yeah. Just mentioned he has tutoring hours on Monday, if you want want more help. And you know, of course, um, office hours with me on Wednesday, or just basically anytime you have any questions, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks. Thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. All right. Bye bye.